and um, I currently am coming to you from the ancestral lands of the Tohono O'odham and the Pascuayaki, also known as Tucson, Arizona. And I direct a program called the Sonoran Joint Venture, as Luke mentioned, which is a binational partnership that brings together people and organizations from the Southwest United States and Northwestern Mexico to conserve birds and their habitats. And today we're really thrilled to be partnering with Tucson Audubon Society to br bring you this fascinating virtual presentation about eared quetzals. And um, it's going to be a bilingual presentation. And so my introduction will also be bilingual. I'm going to give it in English and then I'm gonna give it again in Spanish, much as the presentation will be given. Javier Cruz Nieto has worked with diverse Mexican institutions on monitoring and conservation of priority species and habitats. He's currently a field technician with the Organización Vida Silvestre, wildlife organization, which is a Mexican nonprofit that undertakes conservation work throughout Northern Mexico. For more than 25 years, he's worked in the Sierra Madre Occidental on the conservation of thick-billed parrots and other associated species, undertaking a comprehensive conservation program for old growth forests in the region, as well as uh, the implementation of good forestry practices. Other species he has studied includes maroon-fronted parrot and Nuevo Leon, Sierra Madre Sparrow uh, near Durango, and golden eagles across the states of Sonora and Chihuahua. He developed these projects in collaboration with organizations including the Arizona Game and Fish Department, the San Diego Zoo, and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, as well as diverse Mexican institutions, including universities, nonprofits, and uh, various agencies in the government. These efforts also benefited eared quetzals and their habitat, and every year Javier documents numerous quetzal nests and studies them, and he's going to tell us about his work doing that today. Our second presenter is Micah Riegner, a native of Prescott, Arizona, who grew up birding and exploring the central Arizona highlands. He studied at Prescott College, and while he was working on his master's degree studying wood creepers in Brazil, he began leading tours for a company called Field Guides. He's since led numerous tours throughout Latin America, mostly in Brazil, Suriname, Bolivia, and Mexico. And last August, he traveled with Brett Whitney to meet up with Javier and film both thick-billed parrots and eared quetzals in Chihuahua for their Field Guides video series, outbirding.com. He looks forward to presenting some of the video clips and stories from that trip. And it's my great pleasure to introduce Javier and Micah, who will be speaking with us today. Y ahora en español, mi nombre es Jenny Duberstein, mis pronombres son ella y ella. Y ellas vivo en, en las tierras ancestrales de los Tohono O'odham y Pascuayaki, también conocido como Tucson, Arizona. Y soy la directora de un programa que se llama Sonoran Joint Venture, o la Alianza Regional Son Sonorense, lo cual es una asociación binacional que reúne a personas y organizaciones del suroeste de los Estados Unidos y el noroeste de México para conservar las aves y sus hábitats. Hoy estamos encantados de estar aquí con nuestros socios en la Sociedad Audubon de Tucson para ofrecerles una presentación virtual fascinante sobre los quetzales orejones. Javier Cruz Nieto se ha desarrollado en diversas instituciones mexicanas en el monitoreo y conservación de especies y hábitats prioritarios. Actualmente es técnico de campo de Organización Vida Silvestre AC una ONG mexicana que realiza trabajo de conservación a través del norte de México. Desde hace más de 25 años ha trabajado en la Sierra Madre Occidental en la conservación de la cotorra serrana occidental y sus especies asociadas, realizando un programa integral de conservación de bosques antiguos de la región, así como la implementación de buenas prácticas forestales. También ha estudiado especies incluyendo cotorro serrano oriental en Nuevo León, el gorrián serrano cerca de Durango y la águila real en Sonora y Chihuahua. Esos proyectos lo ha desarrollado en colaboración con el Secretaria de Vida Celestre y Pesca del Estado de Arizona, el Zoológico de San Diego y el Servicio de Pesca y Vida Celestre de los Estados Unidos así como diversas instituciones mexicanas como universidades, asociaciones civiles y el gobierno. Gracias a todos esos esfuerzos se ha beneficiado a las poblaciones del Quetzal Orejón y sus hábitats. 
Cada año Javier documenta numerosos nidos de quetzales y él nos va a contar sobre este trabajo hoy. Y Michael Rigner nació en Prescott, Arizona. Él creció observando las aves y explorando las tierras altas del centro de Arizona. Estudió en Prescott College y mientras cursaba en su maestría estudiando los trepatroncos en Brasil, comenzó a guiar tours para la observación de aves para una empresa que se llama Field Guides. Desde entonces ha sido líder para numerosos tours a través de Latinoamérica, principalmente en Brasil, Surinam, Bolivia y México. En, agosto, en el agosto pasado viajó con Brett Whitney para reunirse con Javier y filmar tanto Cotorro Serrano Occidental como Quetzal Orejón en Chihuahua para una serie de vid videos de field guides que se llama outbirding.com. Espera presentar algunos de sus videos e eh, historias de ese viaje hoy. Es mi gran placer presentarles a Javier y Maika para que hablen con nosotros hoy. Okay. Gracias, Jenny. Uh, thanks, Luke. Um, I guess I'll share my screen here. All right, does that work? Yes, looks great, Micah. All right. Uh, yeah. Quiere, ¿Quieres presentar? Sí, claro que sí, Micah. Este, eh, mi nombre es Javier Cruz Nieto, trabajo para Organización Vida Silvestre AC. Tengo 25 años trabajando en la Sierra Madre Occidental. El día de hoy hablaremos sobre la biología reproductiva de Quetzal Orejón en, el, en la Sierra Madre Occidental en el estado de Chihuahua. So, uh, he's Javier Cruz Nieto and yeah, he works for... Uh... Obis, uh, organi 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 Organización Vida Silvestre, and uh, he's been working in the Sierra Madre for 25 years, and today he'll be talking to us about the, the eared quetzals, and uh, as James mentioned, I'm Micah Rigner, um, yeah, I'm from Prescott, Arizona, and yeah, I'll be mostly translating this presentation and adding a few things towards the end. Um, so yeah, so, so I'm Mi Micah Rigner, y Y voy a traducir esta presentación para, para Javier. Bueno, eh, en esta imagen eh, observamos eh, a la hembra y al macho de Texas, así como a, al macho eh, en, el, en la cavidad y a uno de ellos volando. Esta imagen la realizó, es de la autoría de Mika. So here's, here's a painting of some eared quetzals I did. And uh, the female here on the left, uh, the male on the right. Um, it's a dazzling bird. Um, there's iridescent plumage and, and they have these sort of wiry feathers on the head, which um, give them the name eared quetzal. Bueno, eh, nuestras especies prioritarias en la Sierra uh, Madre Occidental, estas especies son las especies prioritarias para nuestra organización. Eh, tenemos al jaguar, eh, lobo mexicano, gavilán azor, águila real, cotorra serrano occidental, quetzal orejón, guacamaya verde y bú moteado. So the priority species that they work with um, in the Sierra Madre are, are jaguar the uh, Mexican gray wolf, um, the uh, northern goshawk, uh, golden eagle, thick-billed parrot, eared quetzal, uh, military macaw, and spotted owl. Bueno, eh, los trabajos de investigación y conservación iniciaron con Cotorra Serrana Occidental especialmente localizando eh, nidos, eh, evaluando eh, éxito reproductivo, eh, midiendo y pesando los pollos para conocer su eh, condición corporal, eh, colocación de cámaras trampa para identificar eh, depredadores, eh, revisión de nidos con cámaras remotas, eh, identificación de sus sitios claves como son bebederos, 
perchas, eh, dormideros y más recientemente eh, la colocación de radiotransmisores satelitales para conocer sus rutas migratorias. So yeah, they're in the Sierra started with thick billed parrots and uh, they have various monitoring strategies. Um, they're looking at the reproductive biology of the birds and uh, because they nest in these colonies. And so they go up, their team, Javier's team goes, goes up the trees to monitor these nests. And uh, they're also putting up camera traps to, uh, to uh, study them. For example, these bobcat images were taken with the camera trap. That's a bobcat going into a, a thick-billed parrot nest. And, um, and recently they've been doing radio telemetry on the birds to uh, learn more about where they're going in the winter, uh, their migration, um, and yeah, just sort of how to best conserve the species. And uh, these same methods, they're starting to apply to the, to the eared quetzals. En Quetzal Orejón, eh, en México, se encuentra amenazada por la norma oficial 059, Semarrat 2010. Eh, Marjan Lamertin, eh, en 1996, describe un nido en Mesa Las Guacamayas, en Jano, Chihuahua, a tan solo 55 millas eh, con la frontera con Arizona. Algunas, eh, aunque no se tienen eh, gran conocimiento de la especie, sí conocemos. Eh, las características de los nidos, eh, el éxito reproductivo y la distribución eh, reproductiva. So, uh, your quetzal is uh, threatened in Mexico under Semarnat, and that is the, uh, the Secretary of the Environment and Natural Resources. They deal with endangered species. And back in 1996, Lamertink described a nest from uh, Mesa de las Guacamayas in Janos, uh, Chihuahua, which is about 55 miles south of the U.S.-Mexico border. Um, and sort of what's known at this point is a bit of nest characteristics, reproductive success, and, uh, and the breeding distribution. Bueno, el rango de distribución de la especie eh, se encuentra desde el sur de Michoacán hasta el norte en México, Tajanos, en Chihuahua. Llega al sur de Estados Unidos, Arizona y Nuevo México. Es una especie endémica de la Sierra Madre Occidental. Nosotros a veces le llamamos cauci endémica también. Eh, la especie se reproduce sobre los 2,100 metros de altitud. Eh, la especie es migratoria, sobre todo a la... Eh, es una especie migratoria altitudinal eh, que va hacia los bosques... Eh, a las zonas de transición de bosque de encino a las selvas bajas caducifolias. So, uh, your quetzal, it's, it's endemic to the Sierra Madre Occidental, uh, the mountain range in West Mexico. Uh, they go from Michoacán, the state of Michoacán, down here, all the way up north uh, to the Chiricahuas in, in New Mexico. Um, they nest above 6,560 feet in elevation. Um, and then in the winter, they, they descend to lower elevations, uh, which is something that's, that's still very poorly known. Bueno, eh, estaremos hablando de 39 nidos eh, que se tienen registrados en la Sierra Madre Occidental, eh, en el sur del estado de Chihuahua, eh, está Cerro Muinora, en Guadalupe Calvo, y en el norte, eh, Mesa Las Guacamayas, ubicada en Janos, eh, a tan solo 55 millas con la frontera con Arizona. So, uh, Javier's data set includes 39 nests, and um, the southernmost, actually, it's way down here, in an area, is in an area called Guadalupe y Calgo, and um, the northernmost nests are in Janos, which we mentioned before. A lot of these nests here are in the uh, Ciudad Madera area, mm -hmm. uh, where Javier lives. Con los datos que hemos recabado, eh, hicimos la reconstrucción del ciclo de vida del Quetzal Orejón. Sabemos que se reproduce de mayo a octubre, de octubre a noviembre. Eh, vemos muy pocos ejemplares. 
y vemos que la migración eh, ya en diciembre no encontramos ejemplares y vemos que vuelven a arribar a los sitios de anidación de marzo a abril. So uh, based on our work we came up with, we made this uh, life cycle chart. And as you can see, the breeding season sort of st starts in May, goes through September, October. And in October, November, they begin to leave the Sierras descending into lower elevations. And, um, and so you can see the wintering time is from November through March and April. El hábitat eh, de la especie es principalmente bosques de, de pino encino, eh, áreas ribereñas y las zonas de transición a, a la selva baja caudicifolia. So uh, the main breeding habitat for this bird is up in the pine oak forest, um, but then in the winter they'll descend to these arroyos uh, and they can be found in sort of this riparian habitat. Um, in arroyos along the Pacific Slope. Eh, mostramos imágenes del hábitat reproductivo, principalmente hábitats de álamos, aunque la especie también se reproduce en los bosques puros de coníferas. So uh, here's some photos of the breeding habitat. They, they breed mostly in these aspen forests. Um, but occasionally they'll, they'll nest outside of the aspens in just regular conifer forest. Bueno, estaremos hablando de las características de los 39 nidos que tenemos um, eh, recabado, de los que tenemos la información recabada. Este, tenemos seis especies donde encontramos los, los nidos. Eh, Populus tremuloides, eh, pinos duranguensis, avis con color, eh, pinos estruiformis, quercus y alnus. Sin embargo, vemos una alta proporción de nidos en álamo. So uh, here are some of the tree species that we recorded the, the birds nesting in. Um, 25 of them, of the 39 nests, were in aspens. Uh, another six were in Durango pine, uh, five in Chihuahuan pine, and then one in Mexican white pine, an oak, and an alder. Uh, so you can see they definitely prefer to nest in aspens when they're available. Las características de las alturas de los árboles y las alturas de los árboles Eh, vemos que la altura de las cavidades se encuentran en promedio a 11 metros. Eh, sin embargo, también hemos localizado nidos a, a, desde los 6 metros hasta los 19 metros. Mientras la altura de los árboles en promedio es de 20 metros, pero también hemos encontrado árboles que tienen 6 metros hasta 34 metros. En la imagen eh, de la lateral eh, de la derecha, hay una persona escalando uno de los uh, árboles nido Eh, viendo el contenido de los uh, de ese nido, ¿no? que tenía apoyos, por cierto. So this graph here is showing the nest height and tree height. Um, the nest height varied from 6 to 19 meters high off the ground, and uh, the average you can see is 11.6. And the height of the trees varied from 6 to 34 meters uh, with an average of 20 meters. And um, you can see how big these aspens are. They're, uh, they're pretty remarkable. And here's someone climbing one of them to, to check out a nest. Los diámetros eh, de los árboles, donde se han de, eh, los que se han detectado, tienen eh, 30 centímetros como mínimo y hasta 90 centímetros. Pero en promedio tenemos que son 55 centímetros. Solo para darnos una idea, en el género pinos, Este diámetro nos da 250 años de edad. So uh, we also measured the diameter of the nests or the nest trees, and that ranged from 30 to 90 centimeters, uh, with an average of 55 centimeters. Um, just to give you an idea, a pine that's 55 centimeters 
uh, why it is about 270 years old. Las condiciones de los árboles, eh, hemos observado que el 69% son árboles muertos, el 30% árboles vivos, pero ya decayendo, y el 71% fueron cavidades hechas por carpinteros, y el 28% cavidades naturales, esto porque a veces, algunas veces se eh, rompe alguna rama, o algún rayo eh, hace las grietas donde ellos pueden anidar. También tenemos las dos imagen, imágenes de las eh, dos especies que les proveen ca, eh, cavidades, un melanerpes y el colaptes. So uh, you can see here that uh, about almost 70% of the nests were in dead trees or snags, and then the remaining 30% in living trees. And also close to 70% of the nests were in woodpecker cavities and the remaining 28% uh, natural cavities. So these are formed by a branch breaking off the main trunk or a, a lightning strike. And you can see the two main species that, of woodpecker that they're using is a acorn woodpecker and northern flicker. Uh, maybe if we did this talk 100 years ago, we would have imperial woodpecker on this slide, but, um, but yeah. La distribución espacial de los nidos, eh, hemos detectado que ellos prefieren eh, anidar a exposiciones que se encuentran hacia el, eh, alguna exposición al norte, tanto como al noreste, norte y noroeste, aunque también hemos encontrado nidos al sureste, eh, pero son muy pocos. Mientras las altitudes eh, sobre el nivel del mar donde se han localizado estos nidos, van desde los 2,100 metros hasta los 2,600. Vemos una alta preferencia por anidar sobre los 2,300 a los 2,500 metros de altitud. A los 2,700 metros no hemos encontrado nidos aún, pero no descartamos que existan. Eh, los nidos más cercanos eh, que se han localizado eh, son en un promedio de 2.8 millas, eh, bueno, eh, 1.5 millas, y el más cercano, menos de una milla. So, uh, they measured the aspect of the slope where the quetzals are nesting, and as you can see, a lot of these nests are on north-facing slopes. Um, this probably has to do with, well, they're, they're selecting the more humid um, slope there. And looking at elevation, the lowest nests were around uh, 6,800 feet, and um, all the way up into 8,500 feet, with most nests around 7,500 feet in elevation. And then um, we measure the distance, they measure the distance between nests, and the average distance was one and a half miles. Uh, the maximum distance was 2.8 miles, and the, the closest two nests were less than half a mile apart. Estos nidos han sido localizados, el 87% de ellos, en arroyos permanentes, estos que generalmente tienen agua, y el 13% en arroyos intermitentes, que algunas veces no puedan tener agua. Eh, y de la distancia de los arroyos a donde encontramos los nidos, eh, son a los primeros 50 metros, donde encontramos la mayor proporción de ellos, pero también los podemos encontrar hasta 120 metros de distancia. So um, you can see a lot of these nests are, are within these drainages with um, permanent water, so permanent arroyos, 87%. And then the remaining 13% were in ephemer ephemeral arroyos. And um, we, we found the, the nest within the first 50 meters of water. Um, and then some nests were, about, were up to two, 120 meters from the water. So they tend to select these, these riparian drainages for nesting in. Las características de los huevos son eh, azul verdoso claro. Eh, las medidas son de 2.6 por 3.6 centímetros de largo. Si ven la imagen, eh, se observa un trogón con un huevo eh, que no oclosionó en su pico. 
eh, estos trogón eh, generalmente eh, sacan eh, los huevos que no eclosionan, así como sus heces fecales, para, y pensamos que es una medida antidepredatoria. So, uh, yeah, the characteristics of the eggs, they're this sort of pale turquoise, this blue green, and they're 26 or 2.6 by 3.6 centimeters. Uh, the image here shows a bird removing a nest, this, or an egg. This, um, this egg probably didn't hatch, and so they're getting, getting rid of it so it doesn't uh, smell and attract predators. Um, have yours also recorded them? taking fecal sacs out of the, the nest cavity. So they, they definitely clean that nest cavity regularly. Estos nidos han sido localizados eh, desde la segunda semana de mayo hasta la primera semana de septiembre. Pero observamos una alta frecuencia de nidos en los meses de julio y agosto. El periodo de reproductivo que tiene la especie es en promedio de 54 días. 10 de ellos, eh, diez de, los primeros 10 días acondicionan eh, las cavidades de 19 a 23 días eh, la eclosión y 23 días para que eh, vuele el, eh, el pollo. ¿no? So uh, you can see in this graph, breeding starts, can start in May and uh, last through September with a peak in August. So a lot of these birds are nesting um, sort of with the monsoon season and thick-billed parrots have a similar cycle. They're nesting mostly in August, September. Um, so for the quetzals, the whole nesting cycle takes about 54 days. Um, the first 10 days, they're sort of preparing the, the nest, they're cleaning it out and, and there's a lot of courtship. Um, it's 23 days of incubation um, and then another 23 days of, of caring for the, the nestlings before they fledge. En estas imágenes, eh, traté de hacer, un, de hacer una reconstrucción del crecimiento de ellos. Eh, en las partes de arriba son pollos de tres días, cinco días, nueve días. Eh, la, las fotografías de en medio son eh, de 18 días. Y en la parte inferior son eh, imágenes de 20 días. Eh, a esta edad eh, ya no pesamos a, ni medimos a los pollos porque pueden eh, volar o saltar del nido. So, uh, the first image here up on the upper left, that's a chick that's only three days old. And then the next one here is five days. And then nine days for these two. You can see they're starting to sprout these uh, really dark down feathers. And then in the middle row here are chicks that are 10 or 18 days old. And then the final photo here is of a chick that, a pair of two chicks that are 20 days old. And after 20 days, they can, they can actually fly. So uh, Javier and his team, they don't, they don't weigh them after that, that period. Esta es una tabla de crecimiento. Eh, la especie crece muy rápido, muy, muy rápido. En tan solo 20 días, ellos podrían eh, empezar a, a, a volar. ¿no? So this graph here just is showing how fast they grow. So in, within 20 days, these birds can already fledge and fly, which is pretty amazing. De estos nidos que se han monitoreado, Eh, hemos observado que tienen de 2 a 4 huevos en un promedio de 3.08 huevos por nido. De ellos eh, eclosionan eh, 2.64 huevos y eh, alcanzan a volar 2.24 eh, volantones por nido. So here this graph is showing uh, clutch, clutch size, hatching and fledging. Uh, the birds will lay up to from two to four eggs with an average of 3.8. And then out of those, 2.6 hatch. And then out of those, 2.4 will fledge. And um, that's actually a very high nest success rate, especially for a trogan. Um, probably has to do with fewer predators being up there in the Sierra compared to other trogan species, which are tropical and, and they're a lot more. Predator, nest predators down in the tropics, like 
arboreal snakes and and all sorts of things. Uh, el éxito reproductivo eh, que se tiene documentado eh, eh, sabemos que el promedio de posturas de 3.08 para eh, el último periodo y para el 98-2003 fue de 2.8. Eh, 10 huevos de ellos no eclosionaron en estos años este, y el 10%, el 10 de estos pollos eh, tuvieron un fracaso, nuestros pollos murieron, pero sin embargo eh, alcanzaron a volar 2.4 para el periodo de, del 98 al 2003 y del 2014 al 2020, 2.24 pollos por nido. So, uh, this table shows the uh, the two data sets that they're working with. So 98 through 2003 and 2014 to 2020. Um, in the first data set, there was a mean clutch size of 2.8. In the second data set, uh, 3.8. On both sets, there were uh, 10 eggs that were lost. Um, and so the final nestlings that fledged were 2.4 in the first data set and then 2.24 in the second data set. Algunas observaciones de la biología reproductiva que observamos eh, es que ellos utilizan el mismo árbol uh, para anidar de entre 5 a 7 años de manera consecutiva. Asimismo, los eh, territorios de anidación han sido ocupados desde 22 años a 25 años eh, de manera eh, consecutiva. Si les recordarán eh, del eh, nido que encontró Marjan Lamertin en el 96, ese territorio aún sigue continu eh, continuo activo. De hecho, el árbol se cayó hace tiempo y ellos encontraron un árbol a 10 metros eh, donde estaba el, el anterior. Eh, ambos realizan el cuidado parental. Este, el, Eh, la hembra generalmente es la que incuba por las mañanas, pues eh, de una a tres eh, eh, llega el macho y, y cambia. Eh, también se queda el macho a incubar en las, por las tardes. Ellos son muy sensibles a la perturbación humana. Ellos pueden abandonar el nido fácilmente si llegan a, a molestarlos por las tardes generalmente, cuando ellos ya no regresan al nido. En la mañana podrían regresar y no existir ningún, eh, ninguna amenaza. Este, y la especie tiene uh, muchos competidores por cavidades. So, uh, in their study, they actually, they found that the same cavities were used from seven to five years, or five to seven years in a row. And uh, two territories were occupied for 22 and 25 years, uh, which is pretty amazing. The, uh, the nest that Lamertink found in 1996, that same territory is still being occupied. Uh, the nest tree fell, but um, they're, they're still using the same territory. They found another nest tree about 10 meters away. And both male and female take care of the, the, the nestlings. Um, in general, the female incubates during the morning and then they switch off around noon. Um, and the male comes in to, to incubate and they're, they're very sensitive to human disturbances in this period, uh, especially if you're there in the afternoon, they might not, they, uh, they're very sensitive they, to a uh, disturbance. And there's high competition for nests, um, probably among birds and also among other species. Algunas de las aves, algunas de las especies eh, competidoras por cavidad que se han observado son ardillas, eh, chichimoco, eh, dos variedades de búho, el colapte sauratus y una abeja europea que es exótica para la región. So here are the species that are probably competing for nests, uh, Ebert squirrel here on the left, and then two species of owls, flammulated owl and northern sawed owl, uh, chipmunks, a European bee, which is introduced and it's becoming an issue and Northern Flicker. Algunas de las amenazas que se detectan es el disturbio. 
eh, generalmente eh, llegan a observar los nidos muy de cerca sin saber que está el nido por ahí. Si lo llegaran a estar estas gentes eh, observando por la tarde, eh, pudieran abandonar el nido o que los huevos eh, se hagan infértiles. También tenemos causas naturales, generalmente que se cae el árbol uh, por lluvia eh, o fuertes vientos, ya que son eh, árboles a veces muy viejos. Eh, también el aprovechamiento forestal, eh, es una, principalmente por leña, eh, brotes de ectoparásitos, eh, generalmente por pulgas y chinches que eh, traen los mamíferos eh, y los incendios forestales. So uh, here are the major threats to them, uh, disturbance, so people coming around during the nesting period, uh, natural causes, so if a, the nest tree could fall over in a windstorm, um, and then also forest exploitation, so logging, uh, logging these old, old hardwood, old, old growth forests, um, ectoparasites, and forest fires. Uh, fires have always been a part of the, the system down there, but in recent years, it's been getting very dry, um, like here in Arizona, um, and so forest fires are becoming uh, much more common. Um. Algunos de los eh, depredadores potenciales que tiene la especie, vemos cuatro eh, mamíferos, gato montés, guatí, eh, zorrillo moteado, eh, mapache, y las tres variedades de axíter. So, uh, so the potential predators that can be getting to the nest are bobcat, coati, spotted skunk, raccoon, and then three exhibitors in the area. Uh, Northern goshawk is here, and then sharp hawk and Cooper's hawk um, could potentially get a uh, young quetzal. La dieta observada en, eh, que se le da a, a los pollos en los nidos o a, a adultos alimentando. Tenemos 11 variedades eh, diferentes, ¿no? Tanto en plantas como algunos animales donde obtienen ellos sus proteínas, ¿no? So we had 11 different categories of food items that they were bringing in. Um, you can see there's a, a mixture of fruit and uh, and animals that they're bringing in, lizards, insects. Uh, this next slide actually breaks that down further. Bueno, eh, lo que vemos en, eh, en frutas que ellos utilizan, eh, vemos eh, que prefieren bastante el capulín y las uvas silvestres. Eh, mientras tanto, en la parte animal, eh, de lo que ellos consumen mucho son mariposas, eh, lagartijas, insectos y orugas. Pero si se hiciera una comparación eh, por biomasa, creo que estas gráficas podrían cambiar. So, uh, in this graph, we're talking about the different fruits that they're bringing in. So, this black cherry is, a, is an important species. And um, in fact, they might even time their breeding cycle with the fruiting of that tree. Uh, but they're also bringing wild grape and a whole bunch of other fruits, including manzanita. And then for the animals that they're bringing in, they're bringing in butterflies, lizards, uh, insects. And, and if you're saying that if he wants to do a study on the biomass of what they're bringing in, because it, it could actually be that lizards are uh, a major part of their, their diet if you actually weigh, weigh them compared to the other food items. Okay, so this is a, I'll talk a little bit about uh, my involvement with, with this project. So um, as you probably all know, uh, tourism has been pretty tricky this year. And with Fuel Guides, we've launched this new project called Outbirding. It's a, it's a video series and um, you can see it on outbirding.com. Um, and so in late August, uh, Brett Whitney, and that Ned Brinkley joined us. Um, we went for a few days. Uh, we drove down from Portal. Uh, we, we actually made it, did some interviews with, with Noel Snyder. Um, we did a lot of work with, with thick-billed parrots, both in the US and Mexico. 
and um, and Roseanne Rowlett and Richard Webster set that up for us. So we did those interviews and then we went down to uh, Madeira, which is about five, six hours south of the border and to work with Javier and his team to, uh, to film the parrots and the quetzals in that area. And um, very sad, many of you probably knew Ned Brinkley, he, uh, he passed away actually exactly a month ago. Um, he was a really big part of field guides in the birding community. And uh, we're, still, we're still grappling with that loss, but uh, he was able to join us for a couple days um, initially to go see the parrots because they were they were gonna they were life birds for him and uh so there's ned but um we brought brett whitney brought a a, a blind it's one of these hunters hides that we set up to film the quetzals and um these things are actually very comfortable there's like a sort of a one of those camp chairs and um and there's with the blind over it and a little slit where you can see out of it and uh so we did that film uh, to film the Quetzals actually at two different nests. And um, so, yeah, I just wanted to show a few clips. Oh, in Espanol. Um, si en, en agosto fui con, con unos colegas, Brett Whitney y Ned Brinkley, para, para filmar los Quetzales y, y las um, cotorras allá en Madera, Chihuahua. Y, Ned murió hace un, un mes uh, y era un, un gran parte de nuestra uh, compañía y pues es muy triste. Y pusimos una escondite para filmar a los quetzales viniendo al nido y con eso hicimos unos documentales sobre las especies. So here's some clips of the, the quetzal. Uh, and I'll just play these talk while, while they're going. So this is the male, obviously, with a very iridescent plumage on the, on the breast and back. So that's sort of the, an, an alarm type they do. Also, this is a, that's the flight call. Uh, the so this is footage that, uh, Brett Whitney and I got um, from the blind. And so that's the female. You can sort of see those little wiry feathers on the face, giving it the name of Quetzal. Here's one coming in with food. Actually, that that little clip there, that triple note call, that's a uh, that's what Javier. That's they do that call when they go to the nest, and um, Javier's explained that that's how he finds the nest. He goes and listens for that that call. Um, Esa vocalización de de esas tres notas. Um, Es uno que solo hacen cuando vienen, uh, vienen al nido para, y Javier usa esa, esa vocalización para encontrar los nidos. Se escucha para, para encontrarlos. And, uh, so yeah, you can see that's the female bringing in um, a caterpillar or something to the nest. So that's a little teaser. We, if you want to see that the full episode is on outbirding and it's like a 20 minute uh, program uh, talking about the Quetzals. And Brett's actually working on the parrots, which will be coming out within the next few weeks. Um, just thought I'd include a few little clips of the parrots here. They're amazing birds to watch. Um, and they're nesting in this stand of aspens above Madeira. Um, and a big, it's a, a big portion of their population is just in this one, one grove of aspens. So 
Right. Oops. Okay, bueno. Oh, Javier. Sí, eh, bueno, algunas de las prioridades de investigación que tenemos eh, es, eh, no conocemos nada sobre el rango hogareño, sobre la migración, no sabemos nada prácticamente. Eh, creemos que se van a las zonas de, eh, hacen las migraciones altitudinales a los bosques eh, eh, de encino, a la zona de transición, sobre todo a la vertiente, a esas partes donde están los, eh, las selvas bajas caudifolias, eh, factores de limitación eh, que tiene la especie, de dieta, eh, también no conocemos gran cosa, eh, los hábitats que requiere la, la especie, y grupos, eh, la formación de grupos, eh, generalmente me toca ver en julio, agosto, formaciones eh, de solamente machos, eh, mixtos, eh, a veces formaciones de puras hembras, y también en la parte invernal me toca verlo eso, este, y no sabemos si son grupos familiares o, o qué es lo que está ocurriendo. Tampoco sabemos nada acerca de eh, si ellos reutilizan la misma año con año eh, el mismo eh, el nido, ¿no? No sabemos si son parejas diferentes, ¿no? Porque no tenemos anillos o eh, no están marcados, vaya, como para saber que la especie eh, es la misma la que están nidando, ¿no? El ejemplar es con los mismos. All right, so yeah, there's, there's a lot to be learned about your quetzals, um, especially during the winter. Uh, so where they go in the winter uh, is still very poorly known. Uh, they've, been, they've been recorded in arroyos, uh, sort of at the transition between tropical deciduous and pine oak forest um, at around 700 meters. So that's on the Pacific slope. Um, yeah, in Sonora and Chihuahua and, and, uh, and the Sinaloa in that area. Uh, there's still very little known about factors limiting population. So uh, whether it has to do with food or nest sites or any of that in diet. Uh, there's still, Javier wants to learn more about the diet, habitat requirements, especially for nesting, and also this flock forming behavior. So uh, Javier's recorded uh, flocks of seven to 10 individuals during the breeding season. And sometimes these are flocks of just males, sometimes they're flocks of just females. So uh, what is that about it? Could that be some sort of a courtship thing or are they setting up territories? And then also they form flocks in the winter. So they'll, they'll sort of converge in these arroyos. And I've heard, uh, I think people have seen, I've heard stories of people seeing up to like 13 different birds in, in one arroyo down in, in Sonora. So there's still a lot to be learned. Also Javier wants to work with uh, do color banding or banding of individuals so you can see if uh, males and females, if the same pair sticks together uh, year after year or, or what goes on uh, with that. Um, Javier, you hablo entonces? Uh, hey. So follow, to follow up on that, um, Javier and his team, they're trying to, for the next breeding cycle, the next breeding season, uh, they want to put radio transmitters on the Quetzals and uh, they're trying to get $10,000 to, to get three of these transmitters for the first year. And they are asking, the, well, if you'd like to donate to this project, um, Peg Abbott uh, from Naturalist Journeys, her email contact is here. Uh, her numbers are here and she's the point person uh, collecting that those funds to, to support the research. Um, o quiere, o, bueno, Javier quiere uh, continuar la, este proyecto del Quetzal y poner unas transmisoras en, la, en, en los Quetzales, um, unos tres transmisores para el año que viene y necesita unos 10 mil dólares para ese proyecto y entonces Peg Abbott está colectando ese dinero para, para mandar al, al OVIS para para ese proyecto. Um, so also Edwin Juarez 
from Game and Fish. He's he works with Javier, um, and so if anyone has questions as well, he can you can ask Edwin here. His email is here, and uh, so yeah, here's the team. Uh, we got to work with Javier uh, Jesus, or his nickname was Chewy, and Francelia, who uh, Javier's wife. And she also works with the project doing a lot of the the education program um, in Madeira, Chihuahua, working with the kids to teach them about the parrots, the quetzals, and the importance of these birds. Um, so uh, it's a photo from the Chiricahuas um, that Peg sent me. Pretty cool to see them in the in the snow. Uh, and says Javier. Eh, eh, bueno, pues muchas gracias a muchos de los socios que tenemos, eh, principalmente a la equipo administrativo que a veces no está presente en estas reuniones, ¿no? Y que a veces no los ve. Bueno, pues muchas gracias a la Comisión Nacional de Áreas Naturales Protegidas, a la Universidad de Nuevo León, al USA Fish and Wildlife Service, al San Diego Sub Global, a la Arizona Game and Fish, a Vitro. Ha elegido el largo que nos ha permitido y trabajamos con ellos en muchos aspectos de manejo, en las mejores prácticas forestales. Ellos eh, dejaron esta área de donde están los quetzales y las cotorras en conservación, así como a los servicios técnicos forestales, ¿no? Que nos permite eh, trabajar con ellos en, en la parte de conservación dura, ¿no? Y a uh, Maika y a uh, Brett, a Facebook, a los guías fieles. <risa> Okay, so yeah, these are the, the partners they work with. So CONAP, uh, Comisión Nacional Arias Protegidas, and that's sort of like the National Park Service in Mexico. Uh, the University of Nuevo Leon, uh, Arizona Game and Fish, San Diego Zoo, uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, um, Servicios Técnicos for, uh, Forestales, that's like uh, the Forest Service. And then Ejido El Largo, that's uh, in Madera, that's the sort of the community uh, property that, that manages the forest. And um, so they've been working, well, Javier's team has been working with them to protect these areas from logging, especially the, the nesting areas, which are super important for the both parrots and quetzals. Um, actually, while we were filming the quetzals in one of these nests, one after we wa we watched a, a pair of par uh, parrots nesting in the same tree. So they they were just like another ten meters above the quetzals. So it was like a little, a little condominium with all these birds. Um, so yeah, field guides and then vitro. I looked that up. That's like a glass company in Mexico. So those are the partners that that uh, Javier and his team have been working with. Um, I think, yeah, any, I guess we'll open it, it up to questions at this point. And maybe if Peg Abbott is there, if she wants to say a few words about the uh, the project she's, she's doing to try to support the Quetzal research. Um, is Peg Thank Abbott. you, Javier. Thank you, Micah. Right. Peg, I, I looked earlier to see if Peg was with us. Peg, are you with us? I'm here. Hey, yes, I'm are. here. Let's yeah, see. Like I've got a little bit about it. Sure. I'm very excited. We've already got $500 just from folks here in Portal, including Steve Wolf, who made the first contribution. I think a lot of people saw Steve's images in June when the news first broke that Quetzals were here. But it's been an emotional roller coaster of a year. I think a lot of us feel we were literally saved by Quetzals. They gave us so much joy. And we're really excited to be able to affect their future and work with Javier and the team so that the wild Sierra Madres can support healthy populations. So we're working with Arizona Game and Fish Department. Uh, the funds will go directly to them through a PayPal account and we'll be putting information together in the next few days. So if you wanna send me an email, we'll get you on the list and then we'll have exciting updates all year long as they proceed. 
Yeah, that's this is fabulous. That's great. And I'll be sure to include your email address and uh, your contact information for folks in the follow-up email. And hopefully uh, we'll have a, uh, a good support system for what's going on down there. Micah, Javier, we do have a few questions. Do you have time for, for some questions about Kettles? Hey. <laughs> uh, regarding their, their nesting, uh, a couple of folks were wondering whether they re-nest if they're interrupted and do they ever nest more than once a season? Uh, entonces, si, si, una, si un nido no um, mueren los pollos, ¿pueden anidar otra vez? En la... eh, mira, yo siempre he sospechado que sí. Sin embargo, eh, para eso necesito marcar las aves, para saber si es la misma especie, la, el mismo ejemplar. No tengo marcados para saberlo. Asumo que sí, pero no tengo la forma de mostrarlo. Ah, ok, pero si en um, los pollos, los adultos pueden anidar otra vez en esa, esa temporada, la misma. Sí. Uh, so Podrían cambiar. O podrían cambiar del árbol o hacerlo a un lado cerca. Ajá. Pero, uh, uh, pero eh, para saber si es el mismo ejemplar, tienes que ponerle algún anillo o alguna banda en el ala para saber que es el mismo ejemplar el que dejó ese nido que se fue a otro árbol. Ok, ya, yeah, he's saying that they, they can re-nest in the same, uh, the same season if, if a nest fails. And um, yeah, he's also talking about the wanting to put bands on the birds to to see if it's the same pair coming year after year. Um, oh, that's great info. Yeah, a lot of people are interested in the kettles that we're seeing here in the Chiricahua Mountains. Um, noted, uh, you know, as Tim says here in the notes, um, uh, the kettles seen here in the Chiricahuas were an adult female and a subadult male. And they associated closely together for a prolonged period. Do either of you have any thoughts on whether what kind of relationship they might have had? Like, what, do you think of the mated pair or mother and sub adult chick? Or maybe you have some other thoughts on why the Kettles decided to come up here this year? Uh, si están preguntando de la, los Quetzales que vinieron a Arizona, que ha, había un, un, bueno, un adulto hembra y un su adulto de, de un macho y si, si podría ser una pareja, pienses o... Sí, eh, yo sé que han anidado en Arizona. Eh, yo creo que sí están anidando, eh, sin embargo, eh, tienen que hacer las búsquedas incluso desde antes, desde mayo, junio, eh, y no nada más en un sitio, en varios sitios, sobre todo en las cañadas, a lo mejor con esta información podrían decir, bueno, vamos a, a buscar solo arroyos que tengan agua, eh, puras, todas las que estén en, al norte. Y yo creo que sí estén anidando, eh, de hecho, incluso más pegado a, son, eh, en México más pegado, hay una propiedad de Valeria Austin, que creo que también ahí están anidando, y no, no, no los han detectado, ¿no? pero están dentro de México. Y creo que esta parte de Mesa de las Guacamayas, eh, con... Las Chiricahuas están conectados, ¿no? Uh -huh. Y creo que eh, sí son poblaciones reproductoras las que ustedes tienen. So, yeah, he's saying it's possible that they, they can be nesting or they can nest in Arizona, um, even that they're, yeah, they're just found in Janos, which is 55 miles south. That's the a breeding population in Mexico. And so, yeah, it's a good idea to try to find, well, he said, to try to find the nests in, in Arizona. Um, so, yeah. Good luck to all of us. Yeah, good luck. <laughs> <laughs> um, Jenny uh, shared a, a link to some different, uh, to a, a report uh, on the work that's going on down there with the ear Quetzals. So I'll be, a, uh, I'll be sure to share that in a follow-up email with folks as well. Um, you had mentioned a tree that had both quetzals and thick-billed parrots nesting in the same tree, which sounds amazing. Yeah. Uh, someone was wondering if there's ever any conflict between the two birds for, for nests. 
Um, have you ever witnessed anything like that? Um, has visto algún conflicto entre los las cotorras y los quetzales para para nidos? Sí. Eh, los nidos más altos que hacen los quetzales eh, generalmente las cotorras se los modifican y se los quitan el siguiente año. Eh, ah, okay. ah. O lo, los abren más más grande. Sí, los hacen más grandes e eh, incluso toda la cavidad y al siguiente año se los ganan. Ajá. Uh, okay, so the yeah, the parrots actually can take over a quetzal nest and what they actually modify it. They they make the entrance bigger. Um, so hmm. I think quetzal, the quetzals prefer these smaller cavities, and um, and so that the parrots will excavate the nest further um, for their for their cavity. It's fascinating. One, I know we probably have some other questions, but we're going to cap it here. This last one, Sergio asks, are there any ways to support local communities beyond the research technology or equipment? Um, Se pueden soportar alguna manera de, de soportar las comunidades um, en, what, en la conservación uh, fuera de, del proyecto de las transmisoras de, del equipamiento, ¿hay alguna manera de, de ayudar? Yo creo que sí, sobre todo en materia de audiovisual, ¿no? de comunicación, de cuenta, ¿no? que, que las escuelas tengan uh, sistemas de cómputo uh, o, o acceso a, a, a tecnología para que vayan conociendo acerca de, de otras cosas que hay en el exterior, ¿no? Generalmente son com comunidades con, uh, que no tienen acceso a esas tecnologías, este, o a veces monetariamente tampoco las tienen. Eh, yo creo que esa parte de la cultura y educación les podría ayudar mucho para ir entendiendo gran parte de lo que se maneja en conservación, ¿no? Um, so yeah, he's saying that it's yeah it's possible to support the a lot of these communities, especially in education, to uh, give them money to for computers and and things so they can they can uh, to support their education and um, and conservation of the basically yeah education in the schools. Um, let's see, great. Thanks, Micah. Thank you, Javier. Just on, on behalf of Tucson Audubon and all of us uh, here on this uh, session with you, we just want to really thank you for all the work that you're doing. I know, uh, Micah, it's, that's quite the job you have in translating and, and sharing. Uh, so thanks for uh, helping us there. And uh, it, all for all of us here, if you want to unmute yourself, you most certainly can and just tell everyone, thank you, tell Edwin and or I tell Javier and, and Micah, thank you verbally. It's always good to hear it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This is totally awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Good job, Barry. Thanks so much. Gracias. Thank really appreciate it. Gracias. Thank you. Gracias. Thank you very much. Thank you. Gracias. Good job, Javier. Gracias, Javier. Gracias, Micah. Gracias a todos. Too. I always like that part. All right. We want it, it's good to be able to hear each other. Yeah. So, so and uh keep up the good work, Javier. Keep up the good work, Micah, and hope to see you in person someday. All right. I hope to meet you someday. Right. And thank you, Jenny, for setting this up. All right, bye bye, everyone. Bye bye. 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 bye.